All right, you guys, we are live. One second. All right, guys, we are live back again. Search for Huru, uh, another edition of Doing Business in Africa. This time we're talking about teaching martial arts in Kenya with the brother Amin Ra. Um, brother Amin Ra has a very uh, interesting story. Uh, grew up in South Central LA. And, and relocated to Kenya. It's now been in Kenya now, what, like almost 30 years, um, Amira? Yeah, 20 years. 20 years, been in Kenya 20 years now. So, you know, we're gonna just build on why Amira, you know, just talk about his life in South Central LA, why he left, and then get into, um, you know, what he's currently doing now in uh, Kenya. You know, he's doing some dynamic things. He's um, some very dynamic, um, partaking in very dynamic um, opportunities. You know, especially uh, his specialty is martial arts. He's a grandmaster. I mean, he will kick somebody's ass. You know, you do not want to cross Mr. Amin Ra because you might get beat up or whatever. So we're definitely going to get into that. But uh, Brother Amin Ra, thank you for coming on. Uh, really appreciate it, man. I know it took us a while to link up, but I'm I'm so thankful for having you on. Okay, thank you, and I'm honored to be here. Also, <laughs> thank you. So, so tell us about um, you know, you grew up in South Central. I'm very familiar with South Central. You know, um, uh, my I, I do sales, so my territory was South Central LA, and I tell okay. people that the uh, the makeup now is completely different. It's predominantly Hispanic now. But I'm sure exactly. when you were when you were growing up, it was predominantly black. So I'm very I'm very familiar with South Central, Rock Watts, uh, Crenshaw, uh, Compton. Like I'm very familiar with the, those areas. But tell us about you, you know you growing up in South Central. You know let's 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 build on just how your upbringing was back in uh, you know I guess the '60s, '70s, and some of the '80s back in South Central LA. Okay, I, I grew up in uh, in the 1960s, mm -hmm. and uh, on my at that time, I had about 10 or 15 of us that hung out together, and I was the only one that didn't have a brother, or and didn't have a father in the house. All the rest of my my friends who were black just had their father in the home. Except my mother was a was a single mother. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, that uh, that was one of the things, and uh, I, I I grew up on uh, near uh, Vernon and Western Avenue. If you know Western Avenue, in Vernon. oh yeah, mm -hmm. and, yeah, on Forty Second Hundred block of uh, of that area. So that is uh, the way things were. Then it was predominantly black, like you said, mm -hmm. and then slowly but surely. The makeup changed after. I mean, the years went on. So, when you, when you, when you were in Crenshaw, were there? Uh, when when did when did you experience the white? When did the white flight happen? Because from my understanding, that the South Central area was predominantly white, was it before uh, it was black? Am I am I correct? Yeah, it was white in the in the fifties. Uh, okay. Yes, yeah, yeah, in fact, I remember a time I was. Uh, my mother and I were working in the front yard, uh, and uh, this white guy, which would be rare at that time, drove into our driveway. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember Zach words. He, he just looked out at the car window and said, "You know, I used to live here." Uh -huh. Tell me about uh, Foche Junior High School and Manual Arts High School. These schools he went to, and then he showed me areas in the in the neighborhood that I knew well, and he some, told me about the practical jokes they used to do and uh yeah that was it so they you know they were, it was mostly white but by the time i came it was about it was like 99 percent black mm -hmm. family and one white family although my next door neighbor was japanese but that you know but everybody else in that in the area was it was predominantly black okay now south central has a a uh, very bad reputation about the gang violence. You know, Randy Washington is from South Central as far as he was the founder of the Cribs. You have Tukey Williams, 
Uh, of course, Freeway Rick Ross, he's notoriously known. Um, how did that affect your upbringing in South Central, if it did any type of way? Okay, yeah, we had the Crips and the Bloods there. And uh, there was an occasion when uh, I, uh, my mother refused me to go to the to to Manual Arts High School because of that issue. Mm -hmm. And I had to travel to Los Angeles High School. So one day on the bus, these Crips got on the bus and they beat everybody up and took all their money. When they came to me, I refused to give them. Mm -hmm. So they punched me in the face. And then they ran off the bus and everybody was looking at me and I was like, at least he didn't take my 27 cents, you know, uh -huh. so you guys, yeah, then uh, we had a lot of gang members, you know, I, I, I started in the Black Karate Federation, Steve Sanders and Mohammed, and uh, uh, a lot of his students had uh, had that kind of background. Hmm. So, uh, yeah, gangs were there, but uh like I said, my my mom kind of kept me away from all of that. You know, she, I went to like I said, I went to Los Angeles High School where it was out of the way, you know, in, on Olympic Boulevard. So, you know, I would just have to come home in my area. We had our own little gang called the LaSalle Raiders. Okay. Uh, yeah, we we didn't cause that type of uh, trouble with the police simply because the police station where I was, uh, was right down the road from us. And police cars would, so, you know, we were always, you know, stayed in line on that block, on that particular street at that time. Okay. So when, when did you get involved in martial arts? So you were involved in martial arts back when you were in uh, L.A. And it, a lot, it, it, it's something that a lot of people don't talk about, you know, because you have, and we'll talk about UFC. I don't know if you follow UFC out there. I mean, you have John Jones, you have a lot of talented mixed martial artists who really don't get the uh, the attention they, they deserve, like the, the white martial arts. And then as far as regular martial arts, I mean, you've had some great martial artists coming up. You had, uh, is it the guy with Bruce Lee, is it John Kelly, Jim, Ke Jim Kelly? Are you familiar well, with Well, yeah. Okay, you see here, and I met Jim Kelly, but you see here, I, okay, there is what you see on TV, Bruce Lee's, and then mm -hmm. there is the reality. Those people that are doing the art for real, that are not so much in TV, you don't see them much. Like first, my instructor, uh, Steve Muhammad, was a friend of Bruce Lee, mm -hmm. and he also played in the Enter the Dragon movie. movie. Bruce Lee wanted him to play in that movie. Okay. But people don't really know that. And a lot of the moves that Bruce Lee used, if you look at Enter the Dragon, the way he stands, it came from my instructor. Okay. The uh, Steve Muhammad had the fastest hands he had ever seen, and this is the uh, things that are not that are not really talked about. So you know, in the mainstream media, um, um, he also played with um, Bruce Lai, who, who who came up after Bruce Lee. He played in the movies with uh, with him, and uh, it was because of his talent. My my instructor had more black belt tournament champions. Than any other instructor in the United States at that time, and he had won the Long Beach Internationals, which was the greatest tournament at that time, where Bruce Lee was discovered, along with Chuck Norris and many others. Uh, he won that tournament nine years in a row. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and so these are things that are not uh, uh, presently talked about. You know, we don't understand that we have a long history of martial arts, right? Uh, as black people and. Uh, you know, unfortunately, that that history has been part of the the, the much cover up of uh, you know black people's role in, in martial. We were the ones who invented martial arts. Mm. As I teach my as I teach my Kenyan students here, the, the the Asian learned from the African. It wasn't the other way around. The oldest picture of anyone doing any martial arts is here in Africa, not in Asia. And that picture is older than the first Chinese person. How can they have invented something or been the masters of it when they when they learned from us? And this is the this is the platform that we today uh, we teach from in, the, uh, in Kenya Kempo Federation as well as in the Black Karate Federation. Let, let me ask you this. So many, many some people will say you're romanticizing 
are is romantic, you're romanticizing black people's role in martial arts by saying that we created martial arts. Let, let's, let's build on that. Can you give us the history of martial arts in relation to Africa or Africans? I think that a lot of black people are seeing that uh, there's, a lot, there's a lot of history that's been covered up, that's now coming to light. Can you imagine mm -hmm. 20 years ago, people didn't even know, black people didn't even know anything about what was happening in, 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 in Egypt. And a lot of them still don't know the real, the real story. It's no different than in the martial arts. Now I've trained over thousands. I've trained thousands of students, promoted thousands of students. I have over 75 black belts. Mm -hmm. So you see, when it comes to the experience, okay, that's now you're talking to me. When you come to romanticizing, that's people talking about things that happen in the media. Mm -hmm. that, uh, the Asian or even uh, or, or even the Caucasian has has uh, out, uh, outdone us in martial arts. Because even when you look at today, uh, and you see our performance, it's no different. We're, we're the same. We have that same domination in martial arts than you, that you see in track and field. Or that you right. see in basketball, football, we have that domination in the martial arts. So who, how, you know, that's what I'm saying. How can it be where we have this dynamic physical ability, even though we don't have the history that, that goes with it? Right. Uh, but how can you explain that physical dynamics? You know, how can you explain that? Okay, white people may have invented football, but blacks are better in football. You see. They may have invented basketball, started in basketball, but blacks now dominate basketball, and it's not going to turn. It's not going to turn around from that. The history of the martial arts began with 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 us, not uh, with the Asians or, or 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 anyone else. It started with us, and that can be proven. Now, during we'll say the Bruce Lee era. And then you had The Last Dragon with uh, your boy Tamak, or Tamiak, that, that movie. Uh, martial arts in the black community was very popular, but it somewhat mm -hmm. died down a little bit. It's not as popular now, it's just all about football and basketball. Uh, but yes, I, do it, remember, I do remember growing up where martial arts, everybody wanted to be like Tamak on the Golden Dragon, everybody wanted to glow, or everybody wanted to be like Bruce Lee. How, how do we make martial arts more popular again? in the um, black community. Okay, well, martial arts actually was never really popular because of the fact that in order to to learn this discipline, it takes a lot. And that's gonna, what it's gonna do is gonna take out the average person. The average person is not gonna be a black belt. The, the person that has got the type of dynamic personality, that perseverance, the self-discipline, the will to win, that uh, these are the type of people that become you know a true uh, black belt, but I, I want to point out something else about Bruce Lee, mm -hmm. and uh, this is a this is a fact that people don't really know, is that the, what happened to Bruce Lee was he wanted to be the best, and in order for him to be the best in the movies, uh, he needed he had this he had this problem with his physique, mm -hmm. you, you know the Chinese Asian type of physique. Right. So what he had happened with Bruce Lee was he was one of the first ones to experiment with steroids. Wow. When he took this, so he took steroids, and the steroids is what killed him long before the issue of steroids came out in football with those people. Oh, oh stop the show. Stop the show. So, so, so he the, died of the effects of steroid use. So now when wow. you look at him in the movie and you see his physique and the way he presents it, you understand that that physique is not natural. Huh? Not like Billy Blank's net. Mm -hmm. like, like Billy Blank, you see? So uh, there again, these things that you have to, people don't really see. So I was a green belt. Imagine I had been training for about four years. I was a green belt in class I'm at, who trained with Bruce Lee, and, you know, uh, and Bruce Lee was training at this school some year, you know, many years earlier. So I was a green belt and I was just in a normal class. And then Mr. Muhammad started talking about, yeah, Bruce Lee came to my school and he was, uh, and so I was like shocked because I was, I was a fan of Bruce Lee at that time. And I said, Mr. Muhammad, 
you mean you you trained with Bruce Lee? And then he said yes. And I said, well, you know, how was he? What, how did he? You know, how, how tell me because I had only knew Bruce Lee from the movies. He said he got hit like everybody else. And at that time, at the green belt level, I came to realize that I could, you know, because I knew that now from my instructor. I I said I I looked at Bruce Lee's movies and I said, yeah, you're right. You know, I could have got him there. Oh, that movie did. You know, I looked at it from a different light. It's just that you have to have the knowledge of it. And many people are afraid to say that knowledge and many people are, are profit from keeping that knowledge a secret. So you say so people make it seem like it's a conspiracy city why because conspiracy theory why he died. They're saying that, you know, the Chinese, I don't say the Chinese mafia took him out because he was teaching the secrets, I guess, to uh, non Chinese. That that's when the rumors are heard. So when he when he left, I guess he started opening up his own dojos in America to teach everybody. I guess is the secrets of martial arts that are supposed to keep secret in China. They people were saying that the Chinese mafia or whatever took him out. But you're saying is he died because he pretty much overdosed on on he was on steroids. Too much steroids. Yes, exactly. You can look at him. You can now. Now that I've told you, there's people that are in, are still interested in that. They can go back and look at Bruce Lee in the Game of Death, which he tried to film uh, before. I mean, which he tried to film before Enter the Dragon. And then he he was he was filming Game of Death and he before Enter the Dragon. Then they called him for to do Enter the Dragon, and so he quickly started using the steroids again. So you see his physique in in, in uh, game of in game of death where he's wearing the yellow jumpsuit. You can see his actual physique is very small and he looks even sickly, because he has stopped using steroids at that time. But uh, bef when he got into when he was called to do uh, Enter the Dragon, you know he jumped back on them and he died before the movie was released. They buried him and then two weeks later his wife Linda went to see the movie at uh, see him in the movie. Mm -hmm. So. He never even had a chance to see the premiere of his movie because he died be just before that happened. And what happens when you when you take steroids? Your muscles swell up, isn't it? And it, and it, and, the, and what is the brain? The brain is a muscle. So the, the swelling that he had in the body was also in his brain. And it's so simple. People don't want to talk about it. And I see it a lot of times. You know, even Chuck Norris, even the people, even all those people of that day, are saying he was this, he was that, but. Uh, you have to really dig deep into interviews with, with uh, those those people because they were, you know, they uh, they stand to gain uh, more than they. I mean, they would stand to lose more if they said the truth about uh, you know how Bruce Lee died. So, because from my understanding, watching uh, several Bruce Lee documentaries, they they said that he was one of the first martial artists to, I guess, incorporate like weightlifting into his regiment as far as lifting weights and doing push-ups and that's how he got so ripped. That's what they were saying. But you're saying it's definitely the steroid usage is the reason it's why. Definitely, it's definitely steroid usage. Uh you know, uh he had a weight he had a small weight room in his in his in his house. And uh you know in order to be built like that you would have to have a regiment. You've seen like you seen like the rock. And these people, right. they, they, these people are, are, are serious bodybuilders. Now, Bruce Lee had a body like that, and he was not a serious weightlifter. He, you know, so he, he would take, he would have to train like uh, two or three hours in the gym every day in order to get a physique like that. And he never had that time because he was so busy doing filming. Mm -hmm. So uh, when he, when he was given these type of drugs, uh, you know, uh, you know, he took them. But he, he, like I said, at that time they didn't know even what steroids really was uh, and the side effects that it produced. He was rushed to the hospital uh, several times before he died for the same symptom. And if you look at the symptoms of steroids and you read uh, uh, some of the books of his, his, his autobiography, how, he, how people thought of him, like the way, uh, the way Danny Nasanto uh, talked about him, how he had a quick temper, and the way Chuck Norris talked about him, how he would, you know, how he would really be aggressive in the fighting. These are all the symptoms of what happens when you start taking steroids. So, this is the fact. So his 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 model was to try to be like what black people are naturally. You know, to say that that we have a natural 
uh, power-based bodies. Mm -hmm. Other people envy us, but many people don't want to talk about that. Even in the U.S., you know, you're a minority there. So if you start talking about white people, you have to really check yourself before what you say. But, you know, I've been here in, in, in Africa for 20 years, and I don't have that. I don't see that. I've had white students with in the same classroom as black students. You see? And you can see the difference. Mm -hmm. You can see the difference in the way they fight and the way they train. It's very rare to find a white person uh, that has a lot of talent. You can get a lot of people, white people in the martial arts. And then they can be good. And this, there's many blacks. You can, for, for every white, you can get just another black person that will come out and give them you know, a challenge or, or just dominate them completely. Why is that? You know, and I'm not talking about this in a racist fashion. I'm talking about it as an obvious fact. You go ahead and put somebody who Jordan, Michael Jordan against, um, what's that guy? Not Magic, but uh, the other one. That guy from um, uh, Boston. Larry Bird. Larry Bird, yes. And uh, you can see the dynamics. You can see the difference in that. Now, Larry Bird is good. But you see now, once you say, and you can say, even want to say that he's comparable to Michael Jordan, which most people will say no. Then you have to you put it behind Michael Jordan, so many other players, Michael, Magic Johnson, Kareem. You see, they, they, we dominate. Why we dominate? And when people understand the history, uh, they they can see that you know, you know that. Uh, you know, we have a special gift, and we the original people. So I'll ask this question, then we'll we'll we'll, we'll continue on the uh, martial arts subject. So what you're saying is that black people are more physically superior. Now the someone will say, well, okay, if black people are more physically superior, then they will say, well, look at schools, black people in America aren't doing as good as schools uh, as their white and Asian counterparts. Look at Africa. Uh, African nations aren't doing that well. So black people might be superior as far as physically, but then they'll make the argument as far as mentally uh, we're not. That's the argument they make. What's, what's your rebuttal to that? What would you say when somebody says that? Or makes that argument? Okay, first of all, I have that I have I have taught hundreds and hundreds of children, and as well as hundreds and hundreds of adults. So uh, it's simple like this. The academic way that we are learning is, a, is not, it's not the way we learned as black people. You see, you can do things academically, and that can, if somebody who is not uh, keen to the way we learn, uh, Make it, could, could probably challenge us. So, in the martial arts, uh, I you, you can, uh, if you look at the early uh, people that started in Kempo, like with the, uh, Senior Grandmaster Ed Parker, who's passed away now, uh, he taught in an ap academic format. He taught that everybody had to learn like thirty techniques in each bank and each in each uh, belt level. And this is a lot of techniques, this is like over 200 techniques that the student do, has to remember and, and then perform. This is a, so you have to do a lot of academic reading. But then you have Mr. Muhammad who had very little, very few techniques. But she got out and performed the movements. Like, pow, 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 pow. And his students, the majority of them, 99% of them, which were black, picked up on that rhythm. And this is another, this is another type of learning. You see, you can give a black person learns through rhythmic, mm. like the right brain, left brain, you know. So we're blacks in the United States are in a country where it doesn't favor them. The education system doesn't favor them correctly, based on the way we, the way we are. We learn on a more rhythmic level, as opposed to an academic A B C D E level. So the, naturally, we're going to have that type of uh, a problem. But if you go, if you say something like, uh, I'll, use, I'll use basketball again as an example. Would you say that Michael Jordan is brilliant? In the game, yes. Yes. Okay, now, I mean, how so? 
You know, how, how is that? So how is he brilliant? Now you see, now we don't have that knowledge to really try because I want and I won't try to explain it here on today. Uh -huh. But we don't have that knowledge of how we how we learn. If you see what I'm saying, as black people, we didn't we were not taught in schools before the European came and colonized us. You see, but but we were but we were good at at uh, surviving in that in in the environment that we lived in. It's not that black people are 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 not uh, uh, educated better than than Caucasians or, or or Asians. It's just that the problem we have, especially with racism, is that we're not given that type of credit. For one, and two, the academic way that people are being taught in the United States is not based off our culture, where we come from. We're not taught like that. That's why you can see somebody, you ask a black person to do a uh, rap a song. He can rap a song brilliantly. And, uh, but if you ask him now, what is uh, two plus two times four? Ooh, he has a problem. Here in Kenya, I teach primary students. Uh -huh. And in, 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 in digital education, is, I'm, a, I'm a digital education specialist now. And uh, I see it. I see it all the time. It's not a matter, we should not try to compare ourselves from, you know, with the people who we were stolen, the group brought to, and we're a minority in that, in that country. So how is it that we can measure ourselves against the system that they put together, that they run and control even to this day? We can't. That doesn't mean that we're that doesn't mean that we're less intelligent, and by no means because uh, you know we have a long history, including the pyramids, and in, in Egypt, and that is also a part of a part of uh, what we created, not Caucasians. But they may try to say that they did. Mm -hmm. So what would have made what? Why did you get into martial arts? Like, what motivated you to get into martial arts originally? <clears throat> well, okay, I can say that uh, Bruce Lee had a great part of that. You know, I was a very hyper kid uh, growing up. Uh, my mother even took me to the doctor. They didn't know where, where I was, you know, the way I was. I, you call me and, I mean, where are you? I'm on the roof of the house, jumping from the roof of the house, running, you know. Uh, when we and I always had that energy, so uh, when the um, when when the Bruce Lee phenomena came out, uh, you know it it just it just kind of gravitated toward me, towards me. And then I was uh, my best friend at the time who lived in Pasadena, was uh, was started taking Kempo, and then that that helped. And then you know we went on from there. Mm -hmm. And I just gravitated into it like that. Now I was, at the, I didn't know that at the time that uh, my instructor was being taught by Steve Muhammad, who was one of the greatest uh, martial artists uh, in his day. And after we trained for two or three hours, he'd sit, we'd sit down and he would tell me about this man. And then I was like, I must go see him. But I said, let me wait until I get a, you know, a, my orange belt, because I had no belt at the time. So once I was promoted to orange belt, I immediately went down highway where mr. Muhammad was teaching and uh, I was training with my instructor in the backyard you see and so we were, most of my classes were one-on-one -on -one. so when I went to this hall and I saw this man teaching like 20 people and he was giving out orders move turn left move. I was so scared uh -huh. and then uh, he saw me and he said get come on the floor and I was like oh so I got on the floor and thank goodness my instructor taught me all of the you know all of the basic movements of how you start so I get down on the horse, and I got down on the horse the way, and I looked around. Everybody was like me, and I was like, "Okay, I'm okay." And then uh, I ended up training with my instructor uh, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. I trained in Pasadena, and Tuesday and Thursday I would train with Mr. Mr. Muhammad, and I did that all the way up to Black Belt. Many people, you know, I trained like six days a week for for many years. So you were in South Central LA. And I guess one day you decided, I'm going to move to Kenya. Or have you been, were you, did you ever go to Africa before you decided to relocate to Kenya or did you just up and move? Like what was your motivation, inspiration behind moving or relocating permanently to Africa? Okay, well, uh, I worked at, uh, 
I worked in corporate America for 15 years. Okay. Uh, I was a computer lead computer operator, and for Fortune five com Fortune 500 companies. Mm -hmm. So I dealt a lot. I, most of most of the time, I was the only black in in my department or even in you know shifts. So uh, you know the, we had these runnings with 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 uh, my coworkers. Mm -hmm. um, it was racism there, but I didn't see it. I was still dumb, you know. I don't know. And uh, you know, yeah, I had a lot of life problems, and I was like, I was trying to get it right, but then you know, something would always mess up, and then I was like, how, you know? I couldn't put my finger on it. And there's a lot of stories like that. Uh, even uh, going back from when I when I was when I first went to college, but uh, I had black belt and. Uh, at that time, Mr. Muhammad was uh, teaching at the Temple Number Twenty Seven on Crenshaw. It's gone now, but uh, and uh, I was I was going down to the class because I had made black belt now, so it was like nothing really he could teach me. But uh, I was just following the the way I had been trained for all those many years. And then uh, when I got to the temple, uh, we trained in the basement, so you had to pass by the hall to get to the basement. And there was some uh, Nation of Islam guys. And they said, man, brother, 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 can you just come in and check out this lecture? Check out this lecture. And I was like, I waved him off and, you know, but like that. But the brother was very persistent. And then he made me say, okay, I'll do it when I come out. And I thought that he'd be gone by the time I finished class. I came out an hour and a half later that he was standing right there. Okay, so I was caught. So I went into this lecture. And the first thing that I saw was uh, this city hall, Los Angeles City Hall building. And they were pointing at the top of the building. It was a step pyramid. And then it said the pillars that come down are these pillars that are found in in Egypt, and I was like, wow, you know, because I, I had I had I had always wanted to be an LAPD, and I was an LAPD, and, and got racism out of the LAPD, and uh, the symbol really got to me. So uh, I asked him where where do you you know where can I get more information, and the guy said uh, gave me this guy's number, <clears throat> Ashwa Quazi, and so. I went home and the next day was a Saturday. I called him early in the morning and he said, yeah, you know, I, I, you, you can come. I have one tape, but I'm still developing these, these tapes. And I said, okay, where do you, where do you stay? He said, uh, on Sycamore. And I was like, I'm on Cloverdale. So just one block over. So I didn't even drive. I just walked around early in the morning and the guy started talking to me. And I remember one of the things he said, uh, uh, Jesus, was, Jesus was a black man. And I, I remember like, what? Jesus is a black man? You know, how is that, you know? And uh, from what I remember, it was that was from morning until evening. It was getting dark. He sat with me in his house and on the front line of his house, educating me on all the stupid, stupid questions that I that I had about uh, you know about life. And uh, it opened my eyes. You know, they gave me a VHS tape. And see, that was the thing. Those days, that's what crazy. Who was a you know who who who, who was taught by. Uh, Dr. Dr. Ben, Dr. Yusuf Ben mm -hmm. and Dr. Yusuf Ben Yakinen taught as a lecture for him. You know, you see, get a, he would go to a lecture and people in the hall. But what Ashwa did was he put the lecture on VHS tape, which had just came out that those early parts of the '80s, and I just happened to have bought a VHS machine. So he gave me this one tape and said, you know, the other tape is not finished. You come back for it in a in a couple of days. So I took the tape home, and as you know. With a VHS, you can rewind it. So I was rewinding, rewinding, listening to it until I was, until I had memorized the information, and it was like a shock, you know. I would sometimes sit on the couch for hours in my underwear, just staring at this tape, playing it back, watching it again, because I had been fooled, and I was an educated fool for so many years. It had to be redone into me, redone into me until, you know, it was until I got it. So. Uh, from the watching the tapes, uh, you know, he made so many points and he had so many references. I ended up going down to Esawan Bookshop. And uh, Esawan, buy okay, Esawan is, uh, I think Esawan might have, in Lamar Park, is Esawan, I think Esawan might have closed, bro, or it might still be open, I'm not sure. This is in the 80s. So Esawan was just a little boom that these guys had at that time. They moved yeah. over to Baldwin, they moved over to Baldwin Hills and had a really big shop at, later on. Yeah, Lamar Park. Time, in Lamar Park. Yeah. yeah. Well, I don't think they were in Lamar Park. They were in. Uh, uh, it was on Slauson. They're in. They're in Lamar Park now. 
or they might still they be right on the floor. Okay, they used to be next to the Baldwin Theater. They used to be have be they used to be right there. Mm-hmm. But uh, so I had a big library of books and information, and uh, so uh, I was very really learning. So one of the first things that happened was uh, I had to go to Africa. Mm-hmm. Because even at that time, I was like, I'm a doer. I'm going to show me. I'm not going to be like people that just going to talk, you know, because I was like, you know, uh, meeting people and they were talking to all this black conscious, but they had never been to Africa and had no plan to go. Hey, still, still, still goes on to this day. Still goes yeah. on. And I, and I was like, you know, the type of person I was and is today, I, I have to go. So that, in 19, uh, six, and uh, I changed my name legally in 19 on january 1st 1987. so i was serious you see and then you know once you make that change to get away from your slave name it's a it's it's a reality check because you got to meet your family you got to meet your friends you got to you know and you have to tell them this is my name you know and uh, you have to stand by that but i was confident then even though you know you had the VHS tape. You didn't know the reality. Even somebody could lie to you. You know, then you look like a complete fool, and that's something that many people don't want to look like. And so, yeah. So uh, once I changed my once I, I changed my name, I had to change it because I was not that person. You see, I had changed. I was not that person. And how can I go around with a slave name, and I'm not that person? You understand what I'm saying? And if I do something, you have to do it completely. And it's very scary. It is very scary. But trust me, it's correct. In my 35 years they, of, of training, it's a correct. You can't uh, deny it. Now that the social media and Google is there, it's very, everything is verifiable for people that want to deal in reality. So anyway, the second thing after I did, after uh, I became conscious in 1986 and seven. Me, I had to find the location. Which country will I go to? So, you know, they didn't have Google at that time. I had to go to the library, I had to look at encyclopedia. So I'm looking through all of these books and I came up with three choices. South Africa, uh, like Lagos, uh, Johannesburg, and Kenya. Now, I didn't know anything about Kenya. I was like, Lagos was big in the books and, and so was Johannesburg. And when, I looked, when I looked deeper, I found Lagos was too crowded. Right. And at that time, uh, uh, South Africa was still under apartheid, I think. You know, it was like, you know, no. So then I looked at this third choice, you know, and the third choice was like Kenya. And then I read about it, it said City in the Sun. I'm like, wow. Then it said the main language was English. I'm like, yes, you see. Uh-huh. So the more I looked at Kenya, great for me. Now, okay, I picked Kenya. I, you have to have an adapted African country. And remember, you can always change that country later on if you don't like it because you got you know you got fifty two to choose from. So I picked Kenya, and then uh, the next thing you have to do is you have to have Kenyan friends. You see? Right. No, I so I I I ended up finding this Kenyan guy, and this Kenyan guy introduced me to this Kenyan girl, and then we was together with that Kenyan girl for twenty years, two kids. Uh-huh. So and that and so it was. It, it, it was easy for me, you know, from that point because I had the desire. But in actuality, the physical part was easy. It's the mental part, which was the big problem. It's in everybody, you know. And people speak out of ignorance because they have that mental problem that they don't understand that stops them from going. You see? So, you know, uh, that mental problem I had took me 10 years to make the trip. It took me 10 years from, from 1987 to 1997 when I left, you see. But when, once, I came, once I overcame it, you know, it, everything went smoothly from there. So, so I arrived so, in Kenya. Uh-huh. Go ahead. No, so, so you relocated to Kenya. Mm-hmm. What was your, uh, that, there's an echo in the background. Um, but, okay, that's all. What was your, um, how was it as far as setting up a uh, dojo in Kenya? Because there might be other people watching this or watching this who want to teach martial arts in Africa. How was it setting up a dojo and were people uh, receptive to uh, martial arts in Africa? Okay, yeah. I can say that... uh 
uh, the reception for martial arts for me was was great. The Kenyan people, first of all, are really wonderful people. Uh, and at that time, you know, uh, black people were rare. And so, you know, I, people were interested in knowing me and listening to me talk. And then, and, and of course, they were interested in what I had to tell them. So uh, as far as getting students, I didn't really have that problem in the, in the U.S. I had a school for 10 years, and it went, it went from the smallest BKF school to the largest uh, BKF school in, within 10 years. So I just used the same principles, and it just there, there was no difference. People just came, and then uh, if they had a question, I could answer the question, because all the martial art I taught was based on reality. And that was something that was uh, unique at that time. And then as far as the process of relocating from LA to Kenya, how was that process? Did you sit like, I hear people say, hey, I sold everything in America and I showed up to Kenya with just a briefcase. Like what, what did you bring? Was it a tough process? Like what was logistically, like what, what all was, can you tell us the, the background or what all was behind yeah. as far as physically moving? Okay. Um. I, like I said, at that time, I had I had quit corporate America in 1992. I was just working my living as a as a martial art instructor. So I built up my school, and it was very successful. And then uh, I just left it all like that. But uh, I, but, but you see, my issue was I was about to open another location. You know, I was about to work on opening a second location for martial arts school. And uh, I said, well, if I start that now, I will never go that. You know, I'll never go take this trip. You know, and uh, I said, let me just go now. And my, my initial plan was to go for three months. The thing was, I'm going to go for three months, and then I'm going to come back, and then every, if everything goes good, I'll go back. So uh, I, I did like that. Now, I had a vast library of books, which I had taped up in boxes and, and left at my, at my cousin's house, I mean, at my niece's house. And uh, unfortunately, uh, the mistake I made was I just wrapped them up in boxes. I said I'd be back in three months. Then you know, after some years, I, I, you know, there was a big rainfall, and then uh, they all got flooded up. And you know, she didn't know the value of what was in the boxes. So I lost all my collection of books. But then happily, that uh, Google came along and it. You know, <laughs> okay. But uh, uh, so uh, when I, I also remember that, uh, imagine now I have painted my school. And, black red black and green and i'm teaching my black belts and i was talking to them and they would be you know we'd be meeting and talking about our lives and then i would always be telling them ah you guys see you that's because you love the system me i'm 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 out i'm going i'm going out and they you know they had been hearing me say that for years so in the meeting that the first meeting i had to start talking about who's going to be in charge of the school while i'm gone i came okay you know i started talking i started telling them okay now i'll be going on this trip and then and so one of my black belts looked up and said you're really going you know and, they, and i was like shocked because you know i knew i was really going but these people thought that i was joking you see so uh yeah that you know it, it was like that it, and uh so i went to kenya and uh everything everything was uh okay and my first my first impression was why are all these people walking because everywhere i saw people just walking and that was at the, i didn't know at the time that was they're coming from kabira and going into the industrial area. Those are the workers of the morning. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, uh, then uh, you know, uh, my, you know, my my lady, she, her parents owned a farm, so we, we stayed on the farm like that. Then we got our own place, and then uh, I started teaching, and then uh, the classes grew and grew and grew, and then uh, the three months were coming up, coming to an end. And at this time, I had a great following of students in uh, that I was training, and then. Uh, I told them, well, I'll be going back next, I'll be going back to the U.S. next month. And they looked at me and this, the enthusiasm just died out of there. Like, they just, you know, and it touched me, it hurt me. And then, they, you know, investigating into it, they were saying, like, people always come, then they go. Muslims always come, then they teach us, then they go. I like that. So I was like, okay, I'm going to stay and I'm going to make these guys, I'm going to create black belts in Kenya. And then now the, the art can continue into the, you know continue on so I decided to stay a, a year 
And by that time, I was hooked. I mean, by that time, you know, you got to meet people, you got to go places and see things, taste different type of foods, get to know, you know, your guards start to go down. You know, you start, we have a lot of security features in us as black Americans. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of, you know, we people stealing from us, people beating us up, people coming in and doing things to us. You see, so I, I would get in, I would get in, you know, I would have interactions with Kenyans and it would not be there, you see. And I was like, you know, it took me a time, but um, I realized that, uh, you know, th there's a lot of things wrong with us here living in America that is not outside there. And uh, recently, I, I did a I did an article on my Facebook page about peace of mind. Because when you look at all of this thing, it's all about peace of mind. You know, wherever you are in your life, you just need peace of mind and some happiness. And for black people today, uh, you, that's 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 Tanzania, that's Ghana. You know, you're going to get peace of mind uh, if you're searching for it. Seriously, uh, these are. This is where you'll find it. And now, recently, in the last 10 years, uh, more than ever, you're getting a lot of, uh, uh, you know, a lot of uh, economic uh, peace of mind because uh, Africa is growing fantastically. And I have witnessed it. So personally, the growth is just phenomenal. People might don't, don't understand. I lived in Mombasa, and uh, where I lived, uh, when I first came to Mombasa, there was a big empty field, a long big empty field. I mean, it was it was huge, like three football fields before you get to the next little community, you know. And people grazed cows there, you know. And I was like, I would pass through there sometimes walking. And uh, recently, so it's been about two years ago now. I walked back to see, you know, you know how you revisit a place, huh? And I I walked back there. And I got lost. This apartment building is like New York. This apartment building, that whole field was completely gone. I was searching for this field. I said, okay, maybe past the next row of apartment buildings. But in that short, uh, what, six, seven years, that place had completely, that, that, those three football fields were completely overtaken with, with, with development. And uh, it's all through Africa now. I mean, you know, I see it every day. You know, Africa is rising. Let the media say what they want to say. But if you take the top 10 African countries uh, that are going growing by five or six percent and with with the with the economists talking about the growth in Africa is probably going to continue for the next 50 years and then you look at the United States which has an average GDP of 1.9 1.6 yeah. and and you, economically Africa is also the way to go it's not uh, it's not going to get worse it's not going to change it's gonna get. It's gonna grow even more so. So from a from a business aspect, like so, you set up your dojo. You showed. You set up your martial arts studio in in Kenya. Let's talk about how's the I guess tax system in Kenya as far as paying taxes. As far as did you have to have like a specific business license to set up uh, your dojo and run your classes? Like what as far as the paperwork and the fees behind it? Can we can we build on that? Okay, that's a good question. And uh, this is also the mentality that's inside us as black Americans, is that you think that uh, everything has to be, the paperwork has to be official and everything has to, all the T's and dots, all the T's have to be crossed and then, you know. The, but uh, in Africa, uh, and I'm talking about 20 years ago, none of this was, none of this was needed. You, know? you see, uh, I can, I can, I can have, I have I have relationships with the people in the Ministry of Sports. They were my friends. You see, you know. Okay, part of it is because I was, you know, I was, I was an American, but a lot of it was because, of, you know, what I was producing. You know, and uh, you know, uh, these things are not needed. Okay, in my business model, even in the, even in the U.S., I tried to dodge having to pay taxes and you know. And having to do all those other things when I had my school, and there's ways to do that, but uh, in Africa, it's not like that. Now you have Kenyans who are my students, and some of them have, you know, I I I I, I gave up control of the Kenya Kimbo Federation in 20, in 2011, and my predecessors were saying what we need to do is we need to register with the government, 
and uh, I was like, I this thing is not necessary, you know, because I didn't create an organization. I created a federation where each club runs their own club, and they only agreed to have to test on the same requirements. So once every two months or or four months, come together in one of one of the particular halls and have a and have a grading or a promotion. And uh, there was no need for uh, somebody to be in charge and somebody to have a bank account and somebody to have a chairman and a treasurer and a secretary, you know, because even when I was investigating into that, this is the way Kenya saw things. And you see, now I deal in computers and uh, I have built a, pro a program called CCG, Digital Education Program. And how the, the format doesn't even fit. You got a, you got a website. The website is hosted is hosted in, in, in UK and it's run here in Kenya. Even to the time it doesn't have a format for how to deal with websites, you see. So these procedural things you can get around them. You know, and not only like you know, we try to undercut them. I mean basically you a lot of them are not in place and, and, and you know people don't really follow them. You know? What, what's the, what's, what's so, the measure of? What is the these things of uh, uh, pa proper paperwork uh, is not as strict and key as it is in the United States. What's the name of your uh, dojo? In, uh, it, it, am I saying it correct? Is it a dojo? Is that the correct term to use? It's a federation of clubs. Federation we, of we clubs. We have something like uh, 25 clubs in, in, in three different cities here in Kenya. You see, so but you, I, we have we have like where I'm at now. We have four clubs in Mombasa. We have uh, many, many, many clubs in uh, Nairobi, and then we, you know, we have clubs outside of of Nairobi. Then uh, some of my black belts have now branched out and created their own organization, modeled off off of the Kenya Kempo Federation, and then uh, they have their clubs, and then they're growing like that. So the thing is beyond me. And so when I say when people come to say I run things. Uh, no, I don't run things. The instructor decides what they want to teach. And the, when the instructor teaches, they teach Mathis Kimple, which is my martial art, which has basic requirements, which they follow. And then their students, they train their students in that. Then they bring them, then we test them and promote them. And I, I sign their, I certify their, uh, certify that they have, you know, that they have uh, graded properly in, you know, in the different, uh, in the different levels. We don't use the belt system, we use levels. So yeah, level one, two, three, four, five, then black belt. But you're your but your individual dojo. What's the name of it? Okay, now I don't necessarily uh, teach uh, the way I used to. Okay. Mine mine is to go to the to the promotions and do the gradings now. So I have a club that I'm teaching at in Bamburi, but um, you know, it's a small club compared to what I used to teach when I was when I first started. When I first started, you know, I was oh, I was ooh, I had every day, I was teaching three, three for two, three different uh, times every day, and except maybe on Sundays we, we people would come to my house maybe ask me you know we do some training like that. But for every day, I was I was training. I trained at Nairobi University. Uh, we grew beyond Nairobi University. We, I trained at King Polytechnic. They kicked us out because we were too many. So we started expanding like that from, to the to different clubs outside. And then from there, the dynamics changed. I was no longer the one teaching. I was now managing these clubs. And it's through the management of the clubs is uh, you know where uh, my expertise came in, you know, coming from a corporate background. Now you're working on some other projects um, the, as far as digital education. Can you share that with us? Yes. There's a story behind this. Okay, this is our website. Is it coming out the correct direction? It's coming up. See, it, yeah, it's coming up just fine. Yeah. So this is a, a a digital education program. I shouldn't say digital education because digital education doesn't work. In 2011, after I after I gave up the chairmanship and transferred over the chairmanship of the Kenya Kimber Federation, the, uh, I 
I went home and I started had time and I I went to bed and I and then in the morning I woke up and I had this idea of um, you know of, of of students using the phone to do uh, co you know do courses do classes on phone you know high school students and at the time I was dealing with high school students so I came up with the idea of this uh, thing called ccgate.com dot com now that was in 2011 2012 and uh, at that time there was no smartphone there was no G, there was no 3G speed the, you know the internet was impossible uh, um, nobody would even think about going on YouTube and but I had I started developing the site and as I developed the site year after year trying to different things and trying to make it work you know the internet got faster the internet got cheaper and then you know Kenya is, has done phenomenal when it comes to using the mobile phone as a as a banking device. Yeah, so Impesa. Yeah, with Impesa. Yeah, so leave about what people may tell you. Everybody has a phone in Kenya. You know, everybody that everybody uh, has a phone in heaven probably has two or three different numbers. So um, then the smartphones came out and then they went down in price and now everybody basically, uh, if, if you you really see okay. For me, I rarely see people without the smartphone because they can't do WhatsApp, and WhatsApp is the big thing in Kenya. They can do WhatsApp with the smartphone. Hmm? They can do WhatsApp with the smartphone. They can do WhatsApp on no, they can't do WhatsApp on the on the digital. I mean, on the analog, analog phones that of that time. Period. Oh, okay, okay. So now most people most people have they want to get on Facebook, Facebook and. Uh, and uh, and what's up? And then you know, uh, what I'm saying now is that uh, internet prices have gone down. So the the, the digital education program dream that I had mm -hmm. uh, was now becoming achievable. So I was working out of a, a, a cyber cab for so many years, and then uh, I got a, I got a I went to a, pr a primary school who had a had a computer lab with a million shillings worth of laptops. And they didn't have anybody that had knowledge on how to use them. And since I, you know, I'm a computer uh, specialist, you know, I went in and I could fix the computers, and I could, you know, when they broke down, I could program them. I knew network. I networked the the, the laptops, and then they started really working. And I had I was seeing my CCG program on the screens of these laptops, and I was like, wow, this is this is achievable. And this is, you know, and then. Uh, the the guy that they had a guy there that was a teacher, and he was like, you know, working in the lab in spare time, but he had no knowledge of how to make this thing work. In fact, he was watching me. He was in he was in awe, and and then uh, finally he said, "Look, I'm I'm being transferred, and 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 Amin Ra is going to be the one who runs the lab." I was there with the head teacher. He said, "You," and he gave me the key for the lab now, so I was in charge. That was on Friday. On Saturday, someone broke into that lab and stole all that equipment. It was oh, just a okay. oh. there was forty seven laptops, you know, projectors, you know, it was just a devastating, you know, and uh I was devastated more than anybody. And because I had been promising the students you're know, gonna come back next week and we're gonna do you know do things with this program. And uh yeah, it was it was a really sad case and uh you know, it looked like I was done. You know, but I, 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 I went there. I, just, I went to the classroom where the students were, were were studying, and I told them, "I'm never giving up. You can give up, but I'm not giving up. We're gonna make this thing work, no matter." They're clapping and cheering, and uh, inside the lab, we they had these uh, desktops, the very old ones, the big ones. These these things they couldn't carry them. They weren't interested in those big. They wanted the, the small laptop. There were many laptops, many many small ones, forty seven. That they stole, and then uh, they left these uh, twelve desktops, which I never even looked at because we had the many laptops. You see, so I went and started working with them. Many of them had problems. I was able to fix them, and then we we continued. And uh, to cut a long story short, uh, today uh, that school has uh, uh, forty-seven tablets, government tablets, twenty-nine. Private tablets that Samsung delivered us. Samsung also built another lab right next to the one we already have. Then we were given uh, ten uh, desktops with with, with flash screens. So we, the school is blessed. 
with the equipment, and I'm still there. And we're, we're, we're doing marvelous things. The CC Gate program, I realized that digital education didn't really work. And so I had to come up with a whole new design. And uh, you can go to our website or you can go to uh, our Facebook site and you can just see the growth of it as it's, as it's, as it's going along. And I'm able now uh, through the website and the, and the program to, to, to educate uh, hundreds of kids. We got uh, 600 at, at one school, and we got about 900 at another school uh, in Kupanga Primary uh, that we're setting up now. And uh, there, there are about 12,000 primary schools in Kenya that have the tablets. So we're able to give them this new CCGate program that I just created uh, called CCGate Local. It's a, instead of because uh, our biggest challenge was the internet, you know. The school had to connect to the internet on top of everything else, and, and the charges are still too high for someone that has uh, lots of tablets. But I was able to come up with a way to make the program work without using the internet. And this cuts the cost down and makes the thing a reality. So right now we're at the point where we're moving away from, uh, from development and into marketing. What um what other opportunities do you see specifically as far as business opportunities do you see for people who are interested in relocating to a place like Kenya or Africa in general? What uh, what other uh, other opportunities are out there? Do you think? Yeah, you know, you see, uh, when I came to Kenya, I was not supposed to come to Kenya. Mm -hmm. Somebody that comes from from Los Angeles, South Central area. Supposed to be dead. Supposed to be the part of media. Supposed to be dead. I was not the one supposed to come. You know, I was not the type of person that was. I'm a militant black man. Oh no, you see. So you have this educated militant black man from South Central travels over now into Kenya, and I see things from a different light. Most of the guys that come here are educated in college, and have good paying corporate jobs that are, that, that they can afford them to come, or they have uh, business interests with Caucasians. So they can come here and they, you know they don't have a right mindset they don't have a out the right outlook of when they come here you know many people they come here to an african country they stay in the hotel and then they're guided by the by the taxi driver or the uber driver they start asking the uber driver questions and these people are designed and it's their job to deal with foreigners so they're going to give you the best light or tell you whatever they want to tell you but uh me i come and i work with the average Kenyan. I mean, I got a drinking joint. We go drink. You know, we sit down. We talk politics. You know, what I'm saying you and I have all my friends are Kenyan. So I get the perspective from directly from them. So you don't. Uh, you're not gonna. You're not going to. It's very different. Mm -hmm. You know, I see things very different. Economics, like I said, economically the country is growing. Economically, there's so many opportunities. This school, if we're, going back to the government left, the government of Kenya brought out something like two million U.S. dollars worth of primary schools. Mm -hmm. Imagine. So they put all these tablets out to the, to the schools, but this, and they told the teachers to educate themselves on how to use the tablets, and they, and the teachers don't know. They don't have that kind of not that kind of ICT knowledge. They don't have the knowledge of networking. They don't have this knowledge, and there's not enough Kenyans that have this knowledge. You see, so when we were given the tablets, uh, these government tablets in uh, May, I think April or May, and there were schools that had been given these tablets in November two twenty sixteen, because the teachers don't know how to use them, and they and no one is there to teach them. You see, you see, so the government now has to realize that if you're gonna put an IT in the school, you've got to have a specialist. To run that whole system, the teachers are not going to re-educate themselves and turn into uh, computer people, and then do that part time and with no extra pay. So you see the problem. The Ministry of uh, ICT in Kenya just made a call out for ten thousand youth to come for training, ten thousand youth to come for training on ICT so they can try to fill that void using the, using the give it and give the youth jobs. But you see, if the youth don't have any com any com any kind of knowledge of a computer, how can they even start, or even how can they even understand it to value it? You see. So I have uh, I have an apprentice that I'm teaching, 
and, and uh, I'm mentoring him into in the computers. And he's you know he's 17 years old. He, he couldn't get into high school because the family you know had uh, problems getting him into high school. And so I told him, Mom, don't take him to high school. Let him learn ICT here. He can he can take a he can take a, a, an exam anytime. But uh, to get the knowledge that you need in computers in in Africa today. Uh, you know, they, you need a mentor. You can't get that type of training, this type of training in, in a university because the technology is moving too fast. So, uh, yeah, if somebody's in ICT, and Kenya is considered the hub of ICT in East Africa. Right, well, maybe that's the job. The, uh, like the Kenyan, the, you have the, the Silicon Valley of Africa is in Kenya. Like, yeah, I'm yeah, I'm deep into that. I'm deep okay. into that, and I go to Nairobi every month, and I, I go around to the different uh, to the different buildings where these young guys are really working with with uh, ICT and coming up with ideas. Yeah, it's very nice. But many of these people are being sucked in by watching too much YouTube, watching too much you know games, computer games. You know, it's it's like a drug, and it, it, it and it, it unfortunately it's affecting that are in ICT. So they're not being able to specialize in any particular, uh, you know, in any particular field. Uh, they were doing the games industry, and that was a big for a while. But the, I mean, the app, game apps, and uh, they had some 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 computer hubs uh, that were that were allowing uh, people to come in and develop for free and and uh, you know create their ideas. But uh, even now, that is not really. It's not really growing the way it should be. Uh, you need a mentor. You know, you need a mentor. I'm always telling my guy, don't. I have to keep telling him over and over. Don't get caught up on YouTube. Don't get caught up on songs and music and games on the right, on laptop. Right. Same, same. Same thing out here. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's destroying. It's destroying the opportunities. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying is that uh, if you come to Kenya and you have an entrepreneurial spirit. Which is devoid of uh, games and things like that because you have self discipline to know I, I got to make money. Uh, you make it. You will make it. So you know that that's an issue. Now what happens with black folks is that they want to come and they want like to get some royal treatment. But when I come there, I'm gonna have a job waiting for me. If not, then I'm not gonna go. You see, nobody can give you a job. No one's giving right. you a job. To do it. And you think like, oh, I can't go to Kenya because there's no jobs. There's no jobs in the U.S., man. And if you really struggle, you probably need a job. But if you use that same struggling in Kenya, you probably get a job also. And you would not have all of the things that have come along with it. You would not have racism, but you won't have to deal with you. You probably won't even see white people. If, and then, you, you know, people were going to judge you based on your character and what you can give them. How you have it in yourself. So you know that's the, this is the case, and the cost of living is so much more cheaper here. You know, right. like you say, oh, you see this place is dirty. Oh, this is that. This is this and this and that. Yeah, uh, you might come find dirty places in Kenya, or, or or what you call poor places that you don't see in the United States. But one thing you don't see is you don't go under and find homeless people walking around with shopping carts. You will not no, find no, let, let me stop you right there. Stop the show. Let me stop you right there. This is what I tell people about Africa versus America. Like, you might have poverty, poverty in Africa, but what I notice, everybody works. So, you know, you, you know, if you're driving down the street in Africa, you go to a, you're at a stoplight or a stop sign, someone is selling something. Like, you don't exactly. see a lot of people, like you said, pushing shopping carts, homeless begging for change. Homeless begging for money, homeless begging for food. You really, you know, I didn't see that in in Africa the way. And I know you're familiar with the area. You know, in in LA, they got Skid Row. Yeah. Where you just have. I used to have take, my I used to take my students. I used to take my children, my kids' students to to uh, Six and Broadway. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and let them watch, let them see the Skid Row guys, and I stop the band and tell them, now this could be you if you don't have a discipline in your life, you know. And, uh, but uh, I, to get back on that point, it's, it's exactly clear, it's exactly true. You don't see that, right? You can now, now even in in Kenya, in the middle of the day, you might see a group of men sitting and waiting, like they're just like they're doing nothing, they're just sitting. 
these right. people have been working all in the morning since four or five in the morning, bringing right. in the groceries, bringing the fruits, and this is their time to to relax. And they don't have a place to relax. And they, you know, who wants to relax inside a little in a little dark area? They come out and watch the people pass in the street. So they sit out in open areas and like that. That's like you know, what things to do. But trust me, those guys are some hardworking guys. Mm -hmm. And uh, even you know, I have investigated even further. Can I have noticed that even the school, even the homeless children that you might find in Nairobi, few as they are, when they come and they run up to me, and say, you know, you know, Mzungu, Mzungu, give me, and I, I can turn my head and look around, and I can find the mom of that kid somewhere sitting. And she's got her children running out to to beg for money, while right. she sits and watches. You see, so right. yeah, so it's a business. It's just a simple business. And people in the streets, uh, most tourists, they go give these little kids money, and then that that encourages them to keep on doing it. But in a lot of areas now in Nairobi, they have stopped all of that, and you don't see that. People have to get up and work. They 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 were hawking in the streets, and then the 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 municipal council built a big market. Right outside of uh, Nairobi, and all of the hawkers would to, to go there. Okay, so you know these are things that are happening. People don't understand that uh, about Africa. It is not moving in your time. Then, you know, you have to look at Kenya and Africa uh, ten years ago, and then look at Africa and compare it to what you see today. That's when you can be shocked at the growth, because you can remember in the 1970s, Ethiopia was, uh, you know always on tv starving kids blah 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 and then uh, today it's got the highest ranking economy in africa you see so you know uh, africa is changing and it's booming and now is the time for black people who have an entrepreneurial spirit and they can't and they're tired of the you know of the abuse that they're getting in in the united states to realize that it is not a bad option though the media propaganda has made it seem like that africa is booming modern africa there's two types of africa there's modern africa and then there's rural africa wow. i'm talking about modern africa where you come into the city these cities are growing and people are making lots of money they you know they're building new mall in kenya that i just found out they made it they opened the they op i i just found out recently that they uh, they opened the burger king and i was like man you know how much oh, i missed that whopper uh, so I checked on the internet and there were three Burger Kings in Nairobi. I didn't even know about it. I'm like, man. Yeah, yeah they, have, uh, they have Burger King, they got Pizza Hut, they have all that stuff in Nairobi. Oh, I, I didn't throw Pizza Hut. Uh, you see, when I left Kenya, I mean, when I left the U.S. 20 years ago, I remember going to Wimpy's, uh, what is it, Wimpy's, uh, Wimpy's Burgers, because I was the closest right. one to the airport and ordered four Wimpy Burgers, because I knew I wouldn't come back for three months, you know. Uh -huh. <laughs> And then I understand 20 years. So I took a trip to uh, jo to to South Africa, and uh, you know because I wanted to see if Kenya was the best place. You know, so I went to all these different African countries, and I got into Johannesburg and, and saw McDonald's. And I ate McDonald's in Los Angeles, you know, that's like the worst place. Now. But sure. I, was, I was eating them quarter pounders every day. I found myself walking from my my house, my apartment. And walking around but ending up at mcdonald's and eating those you know you miss that food and so what I, my point is that everything that you get in in the u.s is basically coming in africa so you can't even someplace you go you can't even distinguish where you are right you see and then and that's just going to continue it's going to continue and you got the best of both worlds because the culture of africa is not being changed you can still Either go to the modern side of Africa, you pay more money, and live, you know, if you don't live there, or you can move down, down, down into where I'm at now, is the basic uh, lower middle class area, and the middle lower middle class area is it's great, you know, the people, are, the lower you go, the people, the more friendly the people are, and then uh, you have all the amenities that you would have back home, you see, so you know, I don't, I don't. Uh, it's nothing I really miss, but you, I'm going to uh, Nairobi on the on uh, next month. I mean this month, next week, and uh, you'll be finding me at the Burger King. <laughs> <laughs> I might there be for breakfast and for lunch, you know. Mm. Yeah, I don't. I don't eat none of that. When I when, listen, when I go to Kenya, I'm gonna give me a big plate of choma. That's what I eat. Oh. 
You're right. I, I know. I have been conditioned for the for the Kenyan diet, and it has made uh -huh. me. I, I can say I'm very healthy because of that. You know, I don't eat cheese. You know, I haven't had cheese in like two years, unless I go get a pizza. You uh -huh. see, I don't have uh, sugar in my diet. I don't. You know, all my our house girl is the one who cooks for us, so all my meals are fresh. You see, so you know you don't. Uh, uh, I, I I can't complain, but. You, I grew up in Los Angeles. I don't know where many people grew up from. I think if you was in Los Angeles, you saw how many fast food places there were. Oh, uh, every corner. In, in, in the Greek, in, in LA, the Greeks, they, here we go. The Greeks run the uh, the burger spots in LA, in South Central. What? All about it, Greek. All the Tom, it, when you were in LA, was there all the Tom burgers? Like, there's a Tom's burger on every corner. I never heard of Tom burgers. There's like I can't a Tom say I heard of most of the time. It was Burger. It was Burger King and uh, In and Out Burger, and uh, well, In and Out and Burgers. Burger Burger. Chicken. Yeah, you see that? Yeah, Golden Bird Chicken. They don't. Kenyans don't like fried chicken, so you know. I'm waiting for the first. Okay, they have Kentucky Fried Chicken here. Yeah. And but I no, I can't go there. But you see when they, you know, I miss those foods, and uh, you know, I probably have to go one time, and then I remember why I don't why. I didn't, Oh, I, I don't like it, but I know one thing I, that I missed in for about the U.S. One of the main thing was the food and the fast food uh, that I used to enjoy so much uh, is now is now coming here. Well, see, people will say, "Why would it have, like me personally?" I go to Africa for the African food. Like I, I would not miss anything as far as fast food. If I would, when I would locate to Africa, I could care less about. The fast food and that's how the majority of black americans i know who relocate to africa is like look they have better food healthier food they don't have all that fast food garbage like they do here in america but you, you seem different you would actually want and enjoy the fast food no i you know it's just that uh i miss it i mean i'm gonna miss what i mean i want to go to the fast food joint i want to drive up to the window you know it may remind me of home you know I can I have two whoppers with cheese and a, and a vanilla shake? Yes, drive right to the next window. Yes, yes, yes. You see, so it's just like a cultural, <laughs> I don't know, a, a, a theme, you know. But uh, no, I, I've been a, I've been a I've been a health nut since I, before I even got into martial arts. So yeah, I don't think uh, uh, I, I don't think that uh, uh, that's ever going to change. But I do miss Burger King. I do miss Burger King Whoppers, and I and I want to relive that. You know, <laughs> for twenty years, without it's like if you was in prison, you right. know, and then you, you get out and you drive past your favorite food, your fast food place, and you'd be like, "Stop the car right here," you know. Yeah, so I'll be, you know, uh, you know, that's just like it's just like that. But uh, you know, the main point is that uh, you know, shopping mall, you know, these things that the, that Americans. Think like they got it all. There's shopping malls in every country, you know. And countries like Dubai, they just went off the hook with, you know, as far as uh, living uh, and amenities are concerned in a city far, far ahead of the United States. And uh, black people, you know, unfortunately, they come into Africa with their nose up in the air, thinking like they're better. Right. I always try to tell black the blacks when they come here, look, man. You know, you over here acting like you all of that. These people got these people run governments. They run corporations. They build roads. They got standing armies. You know what you got in the United States? You don't even have factories. You don't even have businesses. You see, so mm -hmm. how are you come here and like you got you something that you're not? You know, and it's unfortunately that they think like that. Look at this. You know, it's unfortunately that they think like that. And uh, I try to put them in their place, and they we we have some good arguments. No, you're a lot of them, right. You made a great point about that as well. Uh, a couple more questions, then we'll close out. Um, okay. As far as are you a, a, officially a Kenyan citizen, like a national, or and if you are, how is the process as far as getting that established? As far as Kenyan official Kenyan citizenship and a passport and all that good stuff. Okay, uh, yeah, that's another thing. Um, I left I left Kenya in 2000 
uh, twice. I flew to to uh, South Africa and then I, I came back and then I later on I, I went again, and uh, there was my my passport got really mixed up there, and like I said in those days, uh, the, there was not a strict adherence to dealing with that type of paperwork. Paperwork, you know, me and some others here they don't even we don't even some don't have even the proper paperwork, so you. You know, it's just a matter of uh, how you want to do it. Now, on my side, because of my business interest now, uh, I have to take care of that. I went to the Kenyan Immigrations, and they told me, no problem, you come back with this type of paper, this type of paper. And, uh, yeah, I'll be doing that in the next uh, couple of weeks. But uh, for many years, yeah, you know, I had that problem. And, in fact, uh, I had a case, and I actually went to prison mm -hmm. here in Kenya for seven, and I was, in, I was locked up for 17 days. Why they tried to get bail? Because at the time, the friends I had were American, and they tried to help me. But the the, the system is designed where a lot of uh, European Mzungus, you know, they don't want them to try to get in, put them in jail, and then they when they come to bail them out, they refuse bail for a foreigner to give bail. So we had that issue, but uh, it was a great experience for me because uh, the, it's not the, you know. Uh, the way they treat us as, as as blacks is 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 really wonderful. You know, I think this the 17 days I remember it uh, was was a, a great experience for me. And then the, I mean, I didn't go to prison. I was in remand. You know, until you get your until you're able to pay your bill. I was not in prison. Prison, but uh, yeah, you know, it, it was a, it was a great experience because you know people talk about going to the rock bottom, fear that area. Because I never been to jail before, uh, and then uh, when it happens, uh, you find that it's not as bad as you as you thought it was. So uh, I had to go to court and I got a lawyer, and then uh, all, all this I was found not guilty at the end of the day. So and then and during the whole process, it was I wasn't feeling like a black man because everybody was black. See, so I couldn't call like you know you you're trying to oppress me because I'm black. No, it was you know everything was it was very straightforward. And uh, like I said, I, you know, at the end of the day, I was found not guilty. And it's simply because at the time when they, when I was, uh, when, when the policeman came and asked me for the paperwork, uh, there was some confusion at the police station. And they took me to the police station, there was confusion. And then I gave the guy my passport and I had an abstract. And when you have an abstract, you know, it's even though your passport is out of order, you, you the abstract says that you went to the police department and, you know, and you, you you have notified them, and uh, he didn't see the abstract. So you know, it was some confusion at the police station, and then I had to go to court. And, it, and you know, it's a little it's a small story, and they had some situations, but you know, it, it ended up it ended up like that. Something I had to go through. And uh, I would, if I had it all over to do again, I would I would actually go back and you know, if I had not done it, I would actually I would actually I would actually go for it because. Uh, you know, I had never been in prison in my life, you know, and that's rare for a black man, you know, and, uh, you know, when, when I went through it, it was like, you know, uh, it, 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 it calmed that fear, you see? it calmed that fear, and uh, I also realized that, you know, many greats, you know, Nelson Mandela, <laughs> and I don't know how they do it, boy, you know, Martin Luther King, you know, Malcolm X, uh, yeah, they did actual real time in prison, and uh, and uh, they they were still come out to be great men. So I I enjoyed my my 17 days uh, in lockup, and uh, that just again. Uh, another thing is that you know, imagine if I was in the U.S. and this has happened. Ah, would I get an opportunity? Would get people come up to? You? I have friends that brought me top lawyers to help me. You see? Wow. So you see, it's like I, I, I don't worry, I'm in. You know, don't worry. That's why people tell me, don't worry. They felt bad that I was that I had that I had stayed in those days. And when I went in, I, I didn't know what to think. And then uh, I was in line, you know, where they were coming to search you when you first get into this uh, uh, prison because the, they keep you in remand and prison is in the same place. And uh, the guy behind me just looked at me and said, "Don't worry, I'm gonna help you." And then he 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 fixed things for me. And then I was taken to it to the a special place for in the prison. We got food there. I paid fifty shillings and I got food to, uh, you know. I got extra blankets. I got extra mattresses. You know, 
I was we were sleeping in one night and then I, I heard a phone ring, ring, ring. I'm like, what's this? And the guy's got phones in the prison. I'm like, man, you know. So I said, we call my, you know, so I was able to make a call that night, you know, tell people I was okay, things are fine, this is good, you know, I have met, I'm meeting so many people and learning so many stories. Yeah, so I mean, I don't want to harp on it, but, uh, you know, a lot of the fear that we have is, is brought in from, you know, from thinking that you're going to go to Africa and uh, the worst is going to happen. And right. I'm telling you, yeah, the worst our minds is that we'll be black and nobody's going to give us a break. And nobody's going to help us because, you know, families are and that is not the case. If, you, if you're good, if you're a good person, you don't have nothing to worry about. Even when the prison guards are telling me, don't worry, you, you, your case is cheap, you, what, what, you know. So anyway. That's the, I, I, I I love Kenya. I would never go. I would never. I would never go back to the United States and live. That's just totally impossible. Because a million black men in prison, out of out of <laughs> out of what two million people in prison, a million of them black. No, thank you. And I have been arrested. I mean, not arrested, but I have been stopped by the police uh, several times in while I was in the United States. And it's a scary. It was scary for me back then. And I can imagine what our poor brother, young brothers are going through today, uh, being stopped by the police. Uh, I mean, it, you know, you're really taking your your life in your hands. Have you seen that video where that guy, like, I got a gun in the car and I got a, and I have a, did you see that video? That guy said that. Yeah, uh, you're talking about, um, uh, it was in, um, yeah, uh, yeah, they, I mean, the, the, the brother, was, yeah, he told me he had a gun, he was reaching for his license and he shot him. Yeah, was, uh, like, I, I forgot. I forgot the brother's name. Um, Philando Castile. Philando Castile. Yeah. So you know, I saw that video as many as well as all the rest of them. You know, uh, trade by Martin. All of them. I've been watching them, and I'm like, man, no way. No, you know. So uh, you know, you rarely even hear. You don't even see the police here. I mean, right. Never, right. I have never seen. I can't remember when I have seen someone call the police. Kenya police, and then they come to your house, knock on the door, and then they so no. If you got a case, you go to the police station, and they'll sort that out there. If somebody's done you wrong, you go to the police station, give them uh, that person's phone number, and they'll call that person and tell them come to the police station, and that person will have to come. And uh, it's like that. It's it's not all of this drama, you know. They have they have they have militarized the police. SWATs in in two thousand two thousand American cities, policemen are just like SWAT. You know, and uh, I, if, I'm, you know, I'm I'm almost sixty years old, so I can I can look back and see the difference between what happened in the United States back then and what it looked like today. Shut that door. My kids, they just want to know what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, brother, but we're um in in closing because I have to I have to get out my son. I have to take him to soccer. You know, he has he plays soccer, so I got to take him to soccer. Uh, in closing, how how can people get in contact with you? I know there was somebody in the chat room who's in Nairobi that was interested in um, taking a class. So how can people? What's the best way? Shut that door! <laughs> Shut the door! My kids. <laughs> yeah, I know they were gonna come home. Okay, so this is my name. I can Google this. And then they can get uh in attack and get in contact with me and uh, from this. And like I said earlier, this is the website uh for digital content dedication in Kenya. Yeah, we we have investors and anybody that's got some some skills in uh, developing can also uh you know contact us here. Ooh, my kid. Hey, bring her, bring her, bring her here. My kid. So uh yeah, and another thing is uh, I wanted to say about that is that uh, I've come here to Kenya, uh -huh. and I'm uh, I'm black. Now I'm telling you to bring her, and you're not bringing her. So, uh, <laughs> oh, so uh, and I have kids here. You see, and my kids that are here are now Kenyans. You understand what I'm saying? So in one generation, my kids here will never know all about what racism. You know, I've never had to have to talk with my children about. You know, you're a minority. You know, in a, in a country. You know, you see what I'm saying. And uh, it's another thing that we as black people have to look at is that we always 
being in, in America, you tend to think out for yourself, look out for yourself. But you have to look at the larger picture. And uh, what we really need is we need to have some sort of connection with Africa. And that, that connection is always going to be based on people and, and your children. So one of the things that uh, I can say is that our deal in the educational system here is far better than what's, that we have, what they have in the United States. And uh, uh, you, uh, you can start like that. You can start, if you're not able to come because of whatever reason, uh, you can think about bringing your kids here and, for, and, and having them educate, get educated. And they, of course, they'll naturally meet other, you know, meet other, other youth here. And then uh, relationships are what's, what's, it, what's it all about. So many blacks, they fear coming here because they don't know anyone here. And uh, that's unfortunate. But uh, if you come here and uh, and you have children here, then your whole, you know, the whole issue is gone in one generation. Gone, in, you know, the whole issue of all those problems that we have in the United States is, is eliminated in, in in one generation. And your children are not going to starve and die. And no one, you're definitely not going to starve and die. If you come to Mombasa, I'll make sure you won't starve and die. You know, so. Wow. Yeah, it's just a matter of you know you have to get away from this thing when you think you need to be not a, not even come across on an even kill from the U.S. Many Black Americans they want to come and then they want to be elevated when they get here. You know they want to be promoted up to a higher level. Oh, I want you know I want to be treated like so and so. I can understand the mentality, but uh, I'm sure you know it's, hard work is what pays. Hard work and per persist, being persistent. Persistence is, is the key. But brother, Graham, I'm sorry, Grandmaster Amiral. <laughs> Grandmaster Amiral, uh, thank you for coming on uh, to the show. We're definitely going to have you back again. Uh, like I said, I'm gonna run. I got to take, take my son to soccer. So, uh, But thank you for coming on. Uh, people in the chat room, uh, thank you for, for joining us. Uh, I'll, put you, I'll put your email address in the chat because uh, there's a brother in Nairobi who was asking for it because he's interested in learning more information as far as the martial arts go. So he's going to be reaching out to you. Um, Y'all, okay. uh, make sure if you guys aren't on my Instagram, search for Huru on Instagram. Please go to it, follow, and like the photos. Uh, I'm on social media. Search for Huru on every platform, Facebook, Snapchat, and Twitter, and Instagram. Um, and also go to dynastamir.com. Go to search for Huru.com and go to Amazon.com. Search your name, Dynastamir. Buy one of the books, brother. I'm in raw. What's your? Can they? Can people reach out to you on Facebook as well? I have several. I have uh, also. You know, I wrote a book about. I forgot to talk about that. I wrote a book called uh, "The Black Man's Guide to Visiting, Living, and Doing Business in Africa." So, if you put "Black Man's Guide to to, to Africa" and search that in Google, you can get that information. So, for man, for for martial arts, you can go. You can go on Facebook and search Mantis Kimple. That's Mantis Kimple, M-A-N-T-I-S, uh, Kimple, with an O and an E, uh, and you can get me uh, there. But uh, if you search my name, I think uh, on, you'll get most of the information about what's happening here. And if there's brothers that are in the IT field, uh, yeah, they should hook up with me because there's a lot of opportunity here, and even me, I need help. And uh, don't listen to what the media tells you about Africa. You must come for yourself. And if you don't have it in you to come for yourself, then uh, it's it's here. If you want, if all you want is peace of mind, and and you're tired of all of the things that's going on in the United States, and you're getting frustrated. You have that opportunity. No one is no one is holding you back from leaving. There, there's a million blacks in Canada right now. And people are left, and you know, uh, you know I said you, nobody is holding you back from from leaving. And that I said is the solution. The solution to those those blacks that have that, that have this problem, or they see that uh, uh, they you know that they they're having struggles in the United States, you can leave, and there are good places, far better, and I say far better than the United States. Uh, you can go to. You're not uh, you're not a slave anymore. You can leave, and you can. And the main thing is you can you can go and travel. And if you don't like a place, you can always go back. So I don't right. see what, you know, what the big what the big problem is. People are just feared to come, and I say that it's because of Western mass media propaganda, news, and entertainment uh, that is stopping us from 
uh, stop making us mentally uh, afraid to come to Africa. All right. All right, brother. Well, hey, again, I appreciate it. Uh, thank you so much for coming on. Everybody, thank you for, for joining us today. Brother Amir Ra, again, thank you for coming on. Uh, Till next time, search for Uhuru, the Kapitan Don. Peace.